Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Native Controlling Hypertension and Risk Through Technology webinar series. My name is Gladys Rowe, and I'm a research coordinator at Partnerships for Native Health, a program at the Institute for Research and Education to Advance Community Health, also known as iReach. In this webinar, Dr. Jason Umans will give a presentation on the history of hypertension. Next slide, please. Before Dr. Umans begins, I'll give a brief overview of Partnerships for Native Health at iReach and the Native chart. Next slide. iReach at Washington State University challenges the status quo and advances community health through partnerships and collaboration. We conduct research with rural, native, and Latinx populations, health networks, and populations with substance use disorders. Next slide. Our iReach faculty belong to various colleges at Washington State University, and we partner with external collaborators at universities across the country. The Institute houses five primary research programs, including Partnerships for Native Health. Next slide. Partnerships for Native Health conducts community-based research and education to improve health and reduce health disparities among American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. We do this by working with both community and academic partners in community settings. We focus on achieving health equity, community outreach and engagement, and training and education. We have over 60 partners across the country, including tribal colleges, native organizations, tribes, and universities, as well as seven satellite centers located in Alaska, Colorado, Minnesota, New Mexico, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Washington. Our program focuses on research topics that are important to the populations we serve. Within Native Chart, our aim is to improve control of blood pressure and other risk factors for cardiovascular disease in American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders with diagnosed hypertension. After the conclusion of this webinar, you'll be given a chance to provide feedback through an evaluation survey. By completing the survey, you can be entered into a drawing for one $30 gift card. A recording of the webinar and presentation slides will also be available on our website. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for a Q&A. Please submit your questions using the Q&A box in Zoom. And now I would like to hand it over to Dr. Jason Umans. Hi, I'm gonna, uh, in a sort of flyby, uh, tell a story today. And it's uh, a story of a disease uh, that is shockingly new as a disease, uh, but probably has more impact on cardiovascular uh, disease across the world uh, than any other. Uh, and so it's the story of hypertension, its history, uh, impact, and uh, what drives uh, interventions to treat it, and what led to our current practices and treatment guidelines. Uh, and as uh, people who know me know is my style, um, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than summarize this and state things from a position of authority, I'd rather show you the original data that drove the thinking uh, so that you can understand and feel part of how we came to where we are. So the key questions that we'll address in what's admittedly a flyby talk is what is hypertension? Cut to the chase, it's high blood pressure. <coughs> is it bad for you? Yes. How should we measure blood pressure? Well, carefully, and I'll show you why. Uh, what goes wrong in patients with high blood pressure? I'll touch on that a bit. Which patients should be treated and how? And how do we pick the blood pressure targets uh, that we should aim for when we treat them and, uh, and how should we get there uh, with drugs or other approaches? So this is the beginning of a brief and selective history. <laughs> we didn't have a practical way to measure blood pressure uh, until uh, the end of the 19th, uh, early, beginning of the 20th century, when, uh, when uh, we first uh, developed non-invasive blood pressure measurement. That is a blood pressure cuff, as we know it now. Uh, the cuff itself uh, was, uh, was invented by Riva Rocci in uh, Italy, uh, and, uh, and it um, got you this systolic, that is the top number of blood pressure, and probably with some accuracy. Uh, and then a few years later, Karotkov uh, in, uh, in Russia uh, uh, improved the cuff, 
uh, and figured out that you could listen with a stethoscope for what became called Karatkov sounds, uh, which physicians uh, or other health professionals will use to measure blood pressure along with the cuff. And that allowed us to accurately measure, uh, and the most accurate we currently have uh, in clinical use to measure both systolic, that is the top number, and diastolic, the bottom, bottom number in blood pressure. So what? Uh, we could measure blood pressure. Why would we want to measure it? And what would we do with the numbers? Well, very quickly, uh, by 1913, uh, there was the first data showing that high blood pressure was associated with stroke, congestive heart failure, and kidney failure. This was an association. Uh, it was pretty obvious. Uh, but there was really no evidence of causality. Maybe it's just that people who had very high blood pressure also had uh, a risk for these other things. Uh, it was at about that time that uh, blood pressure measurement became included in every life insurance physical exam. And so a huge database were, uh, was developed, and it was developed in the private sector. And by 1925, the Society of Actuaries reported on about a half million men. Notice that they're men. Men were the only people at the time who actually bought life insurance. Uh, and so that's where we had the data from. Uh, and high blood pressure clearly increased the risk of death. Uh, and that's, of course, what the life insurance industry cared about. And in fact, they were able to figure out uh, not how hypertension caused problems, but the fact that if your blood pressure was very, very high, they shouldn't write you a life insurance policy. And if it was somewhat high, uh, they should charge you more for that life insurance policy. In that sense, they cared about prediction, not about causality. Uh, and they didn't really care whether hypertension was a disease, but it was a great crystal ball that made them money. Uh, by 1939, uh, we had the Metropolitan Life Tables and really more granular data to show that there were progressive increases, not only in mortality, but stroke, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, with increases in either systolic or diastolic blood pressure. And in fact, these are the life insurance data from 1941, uh, showing increasing um, uh, increasing uh, diastolic blood pressure going left to right, increasing systolic pressure going from top to bottom. And you'll see that within any stratum of systolic blood pressure, increasing diastolic pressure makes things worse. These are relative increases in cardiovascular death. And at any uh, level of diastolic pressure, increasing systolic pressure does the same. And the slope, as it were, for systolic pressure is probably steeper. So how does it do its dastardly work? And, and this is just a, a, simple, uh, a simple report from uh, emergency room practice in New York, published in 1955, of 500 people who came in with both blood pressure out of control, that was very high. We still didn't have a way to treat high blood pressure then, or even know if we should. Uh, and, uh, and what was thought to be target organ damage or end organ damage that had been related uh, to hypertension previously. So if, if they had an enlarged heart on their x-ray, if they had fluid accumulating in their lungs or pulmonary edema as evidence of congestive heart failure, if they had cardiac chest pain, angina pectoris, or a change in mental status from hypertensive changes in the cerebral vasculature, if they had an acute stroke or protein in their urine or renal failure, or if they had been previously known to be hypertension, hypertensive, and now their hypertension was much worse, accelerated hypertension. And this is the case mix in the percent of patients who presented with each of these problems, realized that people had multiple problems, which is why it doesn't total to 100. But that's the median survival of those people who presented with those problems. And we use the term malignant hypertension for these people because that's the survival of people not terribly different who had untreatable aggressive cancers in that day and age. This is a bad disease. Uh, these, are now, uh, these are now a summary of more modern data. This, uh, these are uh, data from, uh, from multiple 
uh, from meta-analysis of, uh, of a large series of progressive studies, looking at uh, the uh, increase in mortality uh, due to stroke on the left, coronary heart disease on the right, uh, as a function of age and of usual systolic blood pressure. And again, you can see that at each age, there is a progressive dose response curve of uh, either coronary heart disease deaths or stroke deaths uh, as a function of increasing systolic blood pressure. Uh, these are data uh, from, uh, from uh, 300,000 some odd screenees in the multiple risk factor intervention trial. Uh, and these are uh, death rates looking at systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And as you can see, with increasing diastolic blood pressure going from right to left, there's usually an increase in death. With systolic blood pressure going from lower in the front to higher in the gray at the back, there's more dramatically increasing pressure. In fact, interestingly, the worst group to be in are those with very high systolic and very low diastolic pressures. And we now know that those are people who have very stiff, large arteries. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's why, physiologically, they can have that combination of severely elevated systolic pressure and low diastolic pressure. Back to the history. In 1945, Franklin Roosevelt died of a stroke, uh, which was um, either accompanied by or probably due to his uncontrolled hypertension. His last recorded blood pressure was about 260 systolic. Uh, a few years later began the Framing Framingham study, uh, where we've learned so much, and it spawned other studies uh, that I'll share with you of cardiovascular risk factors in the general population. In the 1940s and 50s, we had our very first treatments uh, for hypertension from a rather severe uh, rice diet, uh, which, was, uh, which was the way at the time to have basically a sodium-free diet, or from surgical, um, uh, surgical interruption of the sympathetic nervous system or early drugs uh, that interfered with sympathetic uh, nervous system uh, that regulates the squeeze in our arteries. Uh, these had lots and lots of side effects. And again, we didn't know whether it actually helped anyone. In fact, there was a very strong belief that blood control, blood pressure control might be bad for you. That is that uh, bl high blood pressure was itself not a cause of disease, but rather a marker of the body's failed attempt to compensate for, quotes, hardening of the arteries. In 1967, the most important pivotal clinical trial was reported. Uh, it was the VA cooperative study. It was designed at the Washington DC VA Medical Center, but done uh, nationally. It used three drugs to treat patients whose diastolic blood pressure was greater than 115. The trial was stopped early because it saved lives. And frankly, at this point, it made hypertension into a real disease rather than an epidemiologic curiosity. At the same time, there was actually a second study, and I'll show you data from both of these, uh, that, uh, that randomized patients to treatment at lower levels of diastolic blood pressure. It ran longer, but also uh, proved benefit. Uh, it took a while, uh, uh, till 1989, for the beginning of the Strong Heart Study, uh, which showed that American Indians, who had been felt somehow to be immune to cardiovascular disease, and where hypertension wasn't felt to be a big problem, that hypertension was, in fact, a powerful risk factor in the population with really the greatest risk of cardiovascular disease in the United States. Uh, these are the data from the VA Cooperative Study 1, that is the very high blood pressure trial. It's a small trial. You can see 70 patients randomized to placebo, 73 to active treatment. And you can see that stroke was cut by 75%. Deaths were eliminated, uh, essentially. And this trial was stopped early after uh, only several months. Uh, but there was benefit across the board. 
Likewise, in the VA co-op study two, uh, which enrolled patients with diastolic blood pressures from 90 to 115. And the rationale at the time is people thought diastolic blood pressure was, quotes, the real blood pressure, not systolic. Uh, and that was later disproven, as I'll show you. Uh, but, uh, but here, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the groups uh, in each arm were larger, as you'd expect, since the uh, predicted risk was lower at these lower levels of blood pressure. Uh, but again, stroke was cut by 75%, deaths were cut by more than 50%, uh, and there was benefit uh, across renal damage, congestive heart failure, accelerated hypertension. Uh, this is the study actually that changed the issue about systolic and uh, diastolic blood pressure. This was the SHEP, the systolic hypertension in the elderly program. Uh, systolic blood pressures rise with aging, and so there was a belief among many, uh, a well-intentioned belief, that maybe older people needed higher blood pressure and that that was normal, uh, and, uh, and therefore that we shouldn't treat it. And so these were patients who had every last one of them perfectly normal diastolic blood pressures uh, and had systolic blood pressures that were elevated uh, to 160 or greater. Uh, they were randomized uh, to treatment versus placebo. Uh, and as you can see, stroke was uh, decreased by 37%, uh, coronary heart disease by a quarter, congestive heart failure by over half, uh, and uh, all over cardiovascular disease by over 30%. And, and, and so, Overall now, looking at some of these even early treatment trials, it's really striking. This is a triumph in retrospect for epidemiology because the observational data showed very clearly that the incidence of CVD, uh, 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 <laughs> cardiovascular disease in all its forms increases progressively with increasing blood pressure. Uh, and, uh, and in uh, randomized trials, the treatment effect is such that it exactly mirrored the observational data. Lowering blood pressure uh, seemed to obviate the risk. And so, in summary at this point, hypertension is both a marker of CVD and a cause of CVD. Risk increases with the severity of hypertension. The benefits of blood pressure lowering, that is of treatment, mirror the risks of hypertension. Uh, and recent and ongoing trials, because we're still doing them, are really asking questions about specific, uh, uh, specific patient groups, specific approaches to treatment, and specific targets of blood pressure control. And so now let's focus on the definitions and on burden of disease. So how much hypertension is really out there? I showed you some of that. Are we on top of it? Are we doing the right thing? How do we define hypertension and grade it, uh, as it were? What makes it severe or bad or, uh, or mild? Uh, uh, how does it interact with other comorbid risk factors? That is, do people have hypertension in isolation or does it go along with other risks and how do they interact? And how is it actually going to kill us? These are data from, uh, from NHANES uh, to get at uh, population prevalence of hypertension. Uh, notice that when we talk about population prevalence of hypertension, and this is, of course, a problem with NHANES, is um, uh, we don't see any indigenous peoples here. Uh, the, the data that we have uh, adequate power for uh, are, uh, are European Americans, African Americans, uh, and uh, and uh, so-called Hispanic or non-Hispanic, that being, of course, a political definition that got enshrined in medicine and medical research. Uh, but uh, uh, across ages, uh, the uh, prevalence of hypertension goes up, as I told you before, uh, uh, so that in older people, a majority are hypertensive, which is why a lot of people would wish that were somehow just part of aging uh, rather than a problem but it's not. I already showed you the tremendous benefit of hypertension treatment in the elderly and frankly, even in the very elderly. Uh, and, uh, and it goes up uh, in all groups. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, uh, some disparities across groups. Uh, we have uh, progressive uh, data over the years in, uh, in prevalence. Uh, so again, these are uh, NHANES data. How many people in the upper left-hand panel have hypertension on exam? Uh, and uh, as a function of age, greater than 60, 
40 to 59, 18 to 39. The prevalences of hypertension haven't changed much over the years. This is pre-hypertension, or what used to be called pre-hypertension, uh, uh, which was at the time 130 to 139 systolic. Uh, this is awareness. That is, of the people who actually had hypertension, how many of them had a diagnosis, had been told they were hypertensive, or were being treated for hypertension? And here, uh, you could say the glass is 80% full. Uh, that is, most people who had hypertension uh, have been told they have hypertension. Uh, and actually, what was really a problem in younger adults has begun to improve. But still, it's so easy to diagnose hypertension. Why don't they all know? How many of them are treated? Again, not everyone who has hypertension is treated. And of those who are treated, how many are controlled? And we're still not there. Now we're going to get some into the definitions and into looking as we push those definitions to lower and lower blood pressure cutoffs uh, for the definition of hypertension. So these are data from the Framingham Heart Study uh, uh, looking at, uh, the, uh, at CVD outcomes by blood pressure, whether your blood pressure was classified at the time as optimal that is less than 120 over 80, as what was then called normal, 120 to 129 systolic, or what was then called high normal, 130 to 139. And you can see that high normal is not a good place to be. It's a lot worse than having perfect blood pressure. Those were the JNC, or Joint National Commission, uh, sixth version of their definitions, this optimal, normal, high, normal. By JNC7, optimal became normal, normal became prehypertensive, and high normal was also called prehypertensive. Now, in the current guidelines, optimal is normal, normal is elevated. And what used to be high normal, we now call hypertension, hypertensive. My, we've had bracket creep, as it were. Uh, so in addition to looking at hypertension in isolation, it pays to look at it with the company it keeps. And so in a population with hypertension, they're also more likely to have dyslipidemia, that is an abnormality of their serum, fats, and cholesterol. And so here, and so is that, you know, is that a bad combination? And let's cut to the chase, the answer is yes. So in, in this large, uh, large meta-analysis, you can see that increasing blood pressure on this axis with increasing cardiovascular death at each level of cholesterol, and then at each quintile of blood pressure, increasing cholesterol increases rates of cardiovascular death. It's a bad combination. We should take care of all the risk factors because they seem to at least add. Likewise, uh, Hypertension itself can cause damage to the kidney, including uh, leaking of protein or albumin into the urine. Uh, and in, at each level of blood pressure, the patients with microalbuminuria uh, have a markedly increased risk of ischemic heart disease. Not only is there an interaction there, I'm showing you data now from uh, from the strong heart study. So these are data from American Indians looking at, uh, at uh, blood pressure with normal blood pressures and what were then called prehypertension blood pressures, that is 120 to 139 systolic in patients who only had prehypertension or in those who had diabetes without prehypertension or those who had prehypertension and diabetes. Bad combination. 
So I showed you those changing definitions. And that last one is the dramatic one where the definition of hypertension itself fell. And that was really driven by this one trial. These are the data uh, from the SPRINT trial that was published in 2015. And SPRINT included patients who were at high risk of cardiovascular disease and asked whether in 9,300 of these patients uh, who were older patients uh, with a broad range of, of hypertension, systolic blood pressure of 130 to 80, uh, whether they would be have greater benefit if they were treated to a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 as a target versus the usual goal of a systolic blood pressure of less than 140. And to cut to the chase, intensive treatment, that is to 120, uh, uh, had a marked benefit in terms of hard cardiovascular outcomes uh, versus the usual target of 140. And so we move the needle, not for everyone, but for patients who had comorbid cardiovascular risks uh, to, uh, to changing the definition and treatment targets for hypertension. Frankly, we should have already known this from the SANS trial, the Stopping Atherosclerosis in Native Diabetic Study, uh, which we did some years ago. It was in JAMA in 2008. Uh, it was a much smaller trial. It randomized 499 American Indians who had comorbid, comorbid diabetes uh, and randomized them to a systolic blood pressure of less than 115 versus less than 130. So in both cases, more aggressive than in, uh, than in SPRINT, as well to tight versus very tight control uh, of their lipids, of their low density lipoprotein uh, cholesterol. And, uh, and while this wasn't powered for hard outcomes, it showed improvement in the progression of the thickness, that is the IMT, uh, of, their, um, of their carotid arteries and of the thickness uh, of the heart, that is the uh, left ventricular mass index, which is an index of moving on to heart damage and uh, congestive heart failure. And so this just summarizes that not everyone looks at the same numbers, but defines them differently. These are the current is ACCAHA, or the current US definitions uh, with, um, uh, with hypertension being defined uh, at in the 120s over 80s for patients, uh, 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 for everyone, and requiring drug therapy in patients who have other cardiovascular risk factors. The Europeans, you can see, uh, are a little more circumspect in how they label patients. So how do we treat these? Well, in fact, um, uh, you know, many years ago, we would have given someone a single antihypertensive drug, but it's from the prospective studies that we realize when we're actually being systematic about things, it's a little bit harder to treat patients with high blood pressure. And depending on what our treatment target is, it can take a couple or three or more drugs to reach that target in different populations. And so these are simply the uh, average number of drugs that it took to get to blood pressure control with these different targets in these different trials. Uh, and uh, in SPRINT, where I just showed you the data, uh, it took on average almost three drugs to get to a target of less than 120. In our SANS uh, trial, uh, for, the, for the loose target, it took 1.6 drugs, and for the tight target, 2.3 drugs. So, Another summary, just to make sure we're all at the same place. There's still a lot of unrecognized and undertreated hypertension out there, frankly, by any definition, and all those definitions. Hypertension is a major cardiovascular risk, and its effect um, uh, is multiplied by all the other risk factors that it tends to keep company with. A treatment, which almost always requires more than one drug, should be tailored to the severity of the hypertension and the comorbidities that it goes along with, be it diabetes or protein in the urine or abnormalities of cholesterol. Uh, risk increases with even modestly abnormal blood pressure, and that's why we keep classifying what we call hypertensive or not. And hypertension, or what we Call, used to call prehypertension does keep bad company with these other risk factors.
I'm going to shift gears at this point to focus on blood pressure measurement a bit. And I do so because almost every study from which I showed you data and all of the guidelines depend on results from both observational studies and treatment randomized trials in which blood pressure was measured with sphygmomanometry, that is using a blood pressure cuff and a stethoscope, exactly as Karatkov uh, did it in 1905, but with real careful attention to detail, that is using the right size cuff, having people sit still uh, and quietly with their back supported for fully five minutes before measuring the blood pressure. In other words, using research grade measurements that are very different than what most people do in the usual uh, physician's office or clinic setting. I will tell you that using home blood pressure monitoring, which instead of being measured by auscultation are automated and digital and measure blood pressure by an entirely different uh, technique, um, uh, home measurements uh, actually um, are much more useful in predicting outcomes uh, than office measurements, but only if those uh, home measurements are proven to be accurate by comparison with, um, uh, with careful measurement by auscultation. Uh, I'm not going to show you any of the data, but, uh, but there are also devices that will automatically measure blood pressure every 20 minutes through a 24-hour period, so-called um, ambul ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, ABPM. Uh, we use these in some patients. Uh, it allows us to measure blood pressure even when they're asleep. Uh, and all of the benefits in terms of prediction that went for having home blood pressure measurements uh, goes even more so for ABPM. Again, you have to show that they're accurate. Uh, I'm going to show you some of the problems uh, or one example of the problems with some of these automated devices, regardless of where they're used. So, the HEM907 is simply the model number of the automatic blood pressure device, and it's actually the one that was used in the SPRINT trial. It costs $700 if you want to buy it. Uh, and, uh, and, in, uh, and these are the validation data from the first uh, study in which it was compared against a gold standard of, uh, of auscultation and mercury sphygmomanometers. Uh, and, uh, and in the uh, in the simple table above shows the percentage of measurements done at the same time in which the, um, in which the HEM907 automatic blood pressure device uh, gave results that were within five millimeters plus or minus of truth. And that is to say this, uh, this device, about as good as an automated device comes, uh, was... Um, uh, was really pretty accurate over half the time. If you only care whether the, uh, whether the blood pressures are plus or minus 10 millimeters of mercury from truth, uh, it's better. On the right-hand side is a so-called Bland-Altman plot, and this shows the accuracy or the agreement of the blood pressures as a function of blood pressure. And what you can see is that the, this automated device tends to be most accurate when the blood pressure is normal. And the errors tend to be much bigger when the blood pressure is high. Let me put that in different terms. In the only patients where I actually care what their blood pressure is, automated blood pressures are prone to large errors. In the patients where it would be fine if I had never measured their blood pressures. It's really good at measuring blood pressure. Uh, for comparison, where you ask, well, you know, how would it be if two people who were trained to measure blood pressure measured blood pressure? In fact, they did that in this study, and, and there was 100% agreement within two millimeters of mercury between two trained observers. And for comparison, so it, you know, is five or 10 millimeters of mercury of a, of a magnitude that would matter? Uh, the treatment effect size in most blood pressure clinical trials is somewhere around two to six uh, millimeters of mercury. So yes, it matters. So the key measure, uh, messages here are there's a lot of unsuspected hypertension out there that you can diagnose by carefully measuring blood pressure. 
I will tell you in my own clinical experience, I've cured a lot of uh, hypertension by measuring blood pressure carefully and finding out that a patient was referred to me for an inaccurate blood pressure measurement. Home blood pressure management uh, uh, measurement and, man and using it in management can be an important adjunct in diagnosis and in treatment, uh, but the accuracy of the device has to be assessed in each and every patient before trusting these values. Uh, uh, and now I'm going to uh, sort of tell you some take-home messages before I show you the data, and that is um, uh, as we shift to treatment, uh, I want to tell you, I already told you some about medications. Now I'm going to tell you about lifestyle intervention. And that is the diet interventions for hypertension work. But there are real problems with, um, with an unknowns regarding persistence. That is, uh, if I can control someone with a change in their diet, how do I maintain uh, adherence to that uh, beneficial diet? And that's a real need for research. And it's research that's being done as part of Native Chart. And so we know that the so-called DASH diet, uh, especially when combined with a low sodium diet, uh, and this is a high vegetables, uh, fruits and nuts diet uh, with healthy fats um, and modest weight loss, this, uh, this certainly uh, benefits blood pressure. Uh, uh, the high potassium uh, seems to actually work in part by uh, lowering sodium. And on average, the benefit of, uh, of a diet intervention is about equal uh, to one blood pressure uh, drug. Uh, and, uh, and not only is that one piece that we're addressing in Native Chart, but another one is that I showed you uh, how many medications it takes to get to a target blood pressure in a randomized controlled prospective trial. But in, excuse me, in real practice, uh, a limiting factor uh, is sometimes adherence to the, uh, to the medications that are given. But sometimes it's not just adherence by patients, but also therapeutic inertia and a lack of aggressive titration by clinicians that leads to poor control. That is that the clinicians can satisfy themselves with blood pressures that aren't at target. And even though patients would have been happy to take more medications in order to control their risk, uh, their clinicians don't push uh, the doses or add more drugs when they're needed. This is being addressed actually in the BPI CAN study uh, to, to address this issue of therapeutic inertia by mobilizing patients and improving communication. Again, it needs more research and we're doing some of that research in native chart. So these are the data from the DASH sodium study. Uh, and what it shows is that in patients who are on a high sodium, an intermediate sodium, or a low sodium diet, as you put them on the DASH diet, and this is just this healthy diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, that you lower blood pressure. And you can see that in patients who are already on a low sodium diet, you lower blood pressure less. Which, which we've worked out now is that some of the benefit is actually lowered by the, is actually mediated by the DASH diet itself, improving the excretion of sodium. I told you that uh, we can lower blood pressure a lot with sodium restriction or dietary interventions over the short term. And so, but as the as the, as the interventions go for longer periods of time, the benefit seems to wane. And so these are simply data from separate trials, some of them very short, like DASH, and others progressively longer, six-month studies, one-year studies, three-year studies. And you can show that the benefit in terms of systolic blood pressure lowering versus uh, the placebo or control arm seems to wane over time. And that's due to decreasing adherence with the diet. So that's the lifestyle intervention. This was the, uh, the uh, non-compliance by clinicians that I alluded to. And this is an old study uh, done in a VA hypertension clinic uh, where in fact patients were only in that clinic because of their hypertension. That was the problem. Uh, and, uh, and this looked at the number of visits and the days between visits in the patients whose blood pressure was well controlled 
moderately controlled, or poorly controlled. Remember, the only reason these patients were in this clinic was for hypertension control. And in fact, the take home message here is that the patients who had uncontrolled blood pressure didn't even have their blood pressure measured at every visit, didn't have their medications adjusted or testing performed to figure out why their blood pressure uh, was, uh, was inadequately controlled. And as you can see, weren't seen any more frequently to try to sort things out. Doctors aren't um, always as, uh, as astute or on the case as you'd like them to be. So um, non-adherence uh, by patients to prescribed medication for any problem is a challenge in any chronic condition. And at one year, uh, adherence is about 50% for drugs. It's certainly better if you can take your drugs once a day. Um, it's, uh, it falls apart if you have to take your drugs three or four times a day. Uh, as, as I showed you some data, uh, uh, adherence to lifestyle changes like diet or exercise tend to be a lot lower. And then compliance uh, of physicians with treatment guidelines is also not so great, uh, especially in terms of appropriate increases in the intensity of treatment. Uh, and in the VA system in 97, for which we had good data, only about 6% of patients with frank hypertension had their blood pressure medications increased. In the all-hat clinical trial, which was a huge randomized clinical trial, which was, however, done in community practice settings, 94% of those with hypertension didn't have their blood pressures uh, medic medications increased, even when it was part of a protocol. So the take home here is that hypertension kills. You have to measure blood pressure properly and carefully in order to find it. Uh, I didn't show you data that the specific cause of hypertension seems to matter. Hypertension shows, uh, magnifies all other cardiovascular risks uh, and is at least additive to most of them, and I showed you some of those data. Uh, Antihypertensive treatment helps tremendously for all patient groups, and I showed you some of those data. Uh, all patient groups, be they the elderly, those with diabetes, kidney disease, prevalent cardiovascular disease benefit by treatment. We have precious little data for all of these uh, messages uh, in terms of native populations, but the benefit might even be more so as we showed in the SANS trial. It's sometimes difficult to control hypertension, and in many of those cases, both physicians and patients often share uh, in the blame. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Hi everybody, this is Corey. If you have a question uh, like Juanita did, please put your question in the chat box for Jason. Okay, so Cynthia West wants to know how we can get more people to take their blood pressure medicines and keep a low sodium diet. Um, uh, I think uh, I think more than anything at this point, uh, I, there's a lot of research on sort of devices and reminders and you know text message reminders and that sort of thing. Uh, to uh, get people to take their medications. I think if there were one high yield 
low cost thing. Uh, it would be for, uh, for clinicians to aim for once a day uh, blood pressure uh, treatment. Uh, and I'd say that's possible for three quarters of patients. Uh, and, uh, and then to combine that with uh, teaching patients to use um, those little uh, seven, uh, you know, seven box uh, medication boxes uh, so that they can organize their meds at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the week uh, and only have to, you know, and, and develop a routine to pop open, here are all of my medications for today uh, and uh, take them once a day. Uh, I, I, those, are, those are devices that I think work. Uh, keeping to a low sodium diet, boy, I wish I had a good way to do that. Uh, I think that's a matter of, uh, you know, some of that's being uh, addressed in Native Chart and in other studies uh, that our colleagues are uh, doing. Uh, I think it's on the one hand, uh, availability and education. Uh, around uh, around um, uh, buying healthy foods, having access to healthy foods, and uh, taking control of actually cooking them, uh, because uh, eating out and convenience foods uh, and prepackaged foods are uh, are really culprits uh, along the way. Uh, uh, Juanita Poor Thunder uh, uh, comments that she wish uh, she knew about this when she was pregnant, uh, and in fact, that's a uh, that's a separate question, uh, all uh, all of itself, uh, and it's one that I'd be happy to come back and talk about. Uh, hypertension in pregnancy uh, has a whole uh, separate series of issues and uh, uh, research and treatment questions. Uh, Javina Moses says, it asks, is 130 over 90 high? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, both of those numbers are high. And what we would do uh, if those are accurate measurements would depend on, uh, on the comorbidities that go along with it. And uh, 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 Beth Davidan asks, um, uh, if clinicians are using a digital blood pressure monitor versus manual, can this still be used as a gold standard for cross-check with a patient's home blood pressure monitor? And, and the answer is, it can be used as a cross-check. It's not going to be a gold standard. Uh, at least what it will do is make sure that the blood pressures that are being reported from home and those that are being uh, measured in the office are comparable. And if you've decided to, to take the ones in the office as your target, uh, it's good to know that you're aiming for the same target uh, and that there isn't an offset. Uh, whether those are actually gold standard measurements, that's that's a separate issue. Uh, the gold standard measurements are the ones that are measured carefully by auscultation according to, uh, to a careful protocol. Uh, do low sodium table salts work? Uh, uh, that's a question from Cynthia West. Uh, and, uh, and the low sodium table salts replace some of the sodium or all of the sodium with potassium. Uh, and, uh, and for people who can uh, handle uh, a, uh, a higher potassium load. Uh, in fact, there is benefit. Uh, uh, how big the benefit is, of course, will depend how much of the dietary salt that person is getting from salt that's added from a salt shaker versus salt that they're uh, getting from uh, convenience foods or ingredients or eating out. Uh, so, uh, so in the abstract, the answer is yes, uh, they can work. Uh, how much they will work uh, in any uh, in any person, uh, you know, is a function of of how much you're actually changing their overall diet. <coughs> uh, and uh, you know, so I've had uh, I've had many patients uh, where I can measure their dietary salt over the course of 24 hours. Most most people don't uh, bother doing this. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, and their dietary salt was sky high. Uh, and I'd ask them, do you add any salt uh, to your food? And the answer is no, I don't have a salt shaker on the table. And then you'd ask them what they eat. And, uh, and they would eat uh, 
uh, Asian foods with lots of soy sauce. They'd eat uh, sausages and cured meats. They'd eat uh, smoked fish. They'd, um, they'd eat things that had uh, salt. They'd have chips and pretzels. And so they were getting their, they were getting enough salt. Of course they didn't add salt to anything. It was already salty beyond my imagination. Um, uh, Juanita asks uh, that she was uh, on meds uh, for hypertension during her pregnancy. They didn't work near to the end, uh, and that can be the case. It can be very hard to control. And she wants to know, will I get hypertension in the future? And in fact, we have a lot of data about that. Uh, and, uh, and the answer is uh, maybe, probably, uh, with probably several fold more chance that someone who had hypertension during pregnancy will develop hypertension later on. And so, in fact, hypertension during pregnancy identifies someone as being at relatively higher risk of, of chronic hypertension, as well as of cardiovascular and kidney disease. And so it's a chance to um, actually uh, I'd, I'd liken pregnancy in some ways to taking a treadmill uh, cardiac test. It's a chance to assess your risk and look into the future so that, not, not to tell you that anything is bad, but to tell you that uh, you should pay closer attention to risk factors and treat them more aggressively uh, than most people will. Um, uh, uh, Beth David asks, uh, do I know what uh, percentage of physicians' offices in the U.S. currently use uh, a gold standard method, that is auscultation uh, versus digital? Uh, and I don't, but I think it's falling. Uh, and uh, the other part is whether it's digital or not. I know that when I go to see my doctor, uh, a medical assistant will, uh, pretty much as I walk into the room, uh, put a cuff on my arm uh, with or without asking me to roll up my sleeve. I will have just walked in, um, uh, often having, uh, you know, uh, struggle to find my ID and insurance card, uh, to park the car, uh, and, uh, and those other little life little stresses, uh, and just sat down, and the cuff may or may not be the right size. And so the error is there beyond those of whether, uh, whether it's a digital uh, device or not. Uh, the other errors about um, uh, being there quietly and rested and uh, and and proper uh, posture and all uh, probably trump everything else and make those blood pressures nonsensical uh, and it's why actually uh, everyone who's tried to use uh, data in the electronic health health record uh, as quality measures to look at blood pressure control uh, has failed because most of the measures that are there uh, tend to be nonsense. Um, uh, and so, uh, if nothing else, uh, that's a problem. Uh, and, and, but it's an understandable problem as we try to, uh, uh, or as you see, our, our visits have gotten shorter and shorter and people want to turn the room over faster and faster. And it doesn't leave room uh, for measuring blood pressure as if it actually mattered. Uh, and uh, then, uh, then Juanita asks, uh, how does hydrochlorothiazide, which is a, uh, a diuretic or a so-called water pill, uh, help with blood pressure? And in fact, what it does is it helps your kidney excrete sodium from your body. Uh, and in a way, uh, you know, so it has the same benefit as a low salt diet, but now on the eliminating salt side, as opposed to the keeping salt from going inside. Those were great questions, thank you. Well, I realized that it was a lot and it blew by fast. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any other questions off offline and uh, and certainly if there are any in, uh, that you'd like to ask afterwards you can uh, you know you can uh, ask ask them through uh, our colleagues at iReach I'm sure they'll forward them uh, to me but I'd be happy to get back to you